Good morning, everyone. Happy Friday. Um, we are going to conclude Unit 5 today and likely start on Unit 6. So if it uh, helps you, go check out or download the Unit 6 uh, slides that are on PolyLearn. Um, the transition from Unit 5 to Unit 6 should be pretty smooth. It's just going to be Unit 5 was how to make the root locus diagrams, and Unit 6 will be how to use them, essentially. Um, so I want to go over to PowerPoint. And let's see here. I think I want to pick up where we left off with the last example problem. So it was this problem that I had you work on uh, on your own, and then I came through and helped finish it up. So uh, given the system pictured in the upper right here, if the proportional controller K is allowed to vary, then the closed loop poles will migrate. At, when K is small, they will start up here and down here by the open loop poles. And as K increases, they will converge on this point in the real axis, which we showed was about negative 1.2. And as K increases beyond that critical point, the two closed loop poles will proceed in opposite directions, one to the east and one to the west. And then for all Ks between some critical K and infinity, you'll have two closed loop poles, one in this region between zero and negative 1.2, and the other traveling in this region between negative four and negative 1.2. Uh, so, any questions on that quick recap? Anyone thought about this problem and had anything percolate out? So I think one more thing that we can, one more question we can ask is what is that critical K? At what K value do the closed loop poles become critically damped? So if we want to solve that, then we're asking what is the K that makes L of negative 1.2 equal to negative 1? That's the question we're actually asking. Because we, we know from our analysis that S equals negative 1.2 is a valid closed loop pole location for some K. And now we're trying to ask or answer, uh, which K is that? So I think what we want to do is we just want to take our expression for the open loop transfer function and plug in S equals negative 1.2. So just treat it like a regular like a function. So there's the zero at the origin. There is the zero at negative four. And then there's the complex conjugate poles. So negative 1.2 squared plus two times negative 1.2 plus two. And then we're gonna solve that when it equals negative one. So let that's a, uh, mildly hairy, so I'm going to bring up my favorite calculator. So if I let s equal negative 1.2, and then the left-hand side, uh, left-hand side would be k times s times s plus 4 divided by s squared plus 2 times s plus 2. And then the right-hand side is negative 1, so then that k is negative 1 divided by the left-hand side. Okay, so the critical value of K here is about 0.31. So K equals 0 0.31. And so if you like, when we set K equal to 0 0.31, the closed loop poles are coincident and they lie at real negative 1.2. This also tells us that any K smaller than 0.31 gives us complex conjugate closed loop poles, and any k larger than 0.31 gives us real and distinct comp, uh, closed loop poles. So this is kind of a new way to use the open loop transfer function. It's to actually get the exact value of k if you know the exact root location. Any questions on this? I was gonna have you all try this, but I think in the interest of time, uh, I'm going to go ahead and take over. Um, so this is a, a new example problem. It comes from your textbook, exercise 7.2. And again, we're going to look for the root locus as k varies positive. So I think the first step is where are the open loop 
holes and zeros. So let's get our real axis here, imaginary axis there. And so there are no open loop zeros. There are open loop poles. So let's see if I can get a different color here. There are open loop poles at the origin at negative two. And if you factor that, so let's go in. I mean, I've got my lab up, so why not? Roots of one, four, five. Okay, negative two plus or minus j. Negative two plus or minus j. So here's positive one on the imaginary axis, negative one, and then these are both that are lying here at negative two. Okay, so four open loop poles, zero open loop zeros, which means that they, we will have four root locus branches. And what's more, we'll have four asymptotes, right? There are no finite places on the complex plane for any of these closed loop poles to go to. So, but let's, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's go and do the real axis uh, loci. So we'll go blue for the root locus branches. So dragging my pencil in from the right, uh, when I'm over here in the positive real half plane, there are an even number. There are zero X's and O's to the right of my pencil. So that's out of the root locus. Once I cross the origin and all the way in here, there are an odd number of X's and O's to the right of my pencil, which means that all of these points will pass the phase criterion. And once I hop over negative two, there are now one, two, three, four X's to the right, which means everything out here is out of the root locus. So the only portion, of the real axis that can be in the root locus is between negative two and the origin. Let's go ahead and work out the asymptotes. So we need the number of open loop poles is four and the number of open loop zeros is zero. So that tells me I need four asymptotes. To get their center of mass, I'm gonna average the locations of all of the poles. So there's one at zero, and there's one at negative two, and then there are two complex conjugate ones, but the imaginary parts of those complex conjugate poles will cancel, so I'm not even gonna include them. And I'm dividing that by four. So this looks like negative uh, three halves. So in green for my asymptotes, I have a center of mass right about there. Okay, and then for the asymptote angles, so the fees, we're gonna go at plus or minus 180 times two times zero plus one, always start the counter at zero, divide by four. So this looks like plus or minus 45 degrees. That's two of the asymptote angles. So then we'll do one more turn of the crank, plus or minus 180, uh, two times one, so I'm incre incrementing the counter from zero to one, and then divided by four. So this is what three quarters of 180, which is plus or minus 135. So for every turn of the crank, you get two asymptote angles out, and we needed four, so I turned the crank twice. So these are going to emanate from the center of mass at plus and minus 45 and 135. So there's one and there's the other. So these are where the branches will head as K gets large. I'll pause there for questions. Uh, so actually, but, let's now, see. Which is the angle that you measure from again? Is it from the negative or the positive angle? Oh, well, here it doesn't matter because it's 45 either way. Um, but yeah. This, <laughs> this is 45 and this is. 135. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yep. Okay, so good. That means that someone can hear me. Um, are there any angles of departure to calculate? 
too? Yeah, for sure. We've got uh, an angle of departure from this open loop pole and one from that open loop pole. But if we do this one, we'll get that one for free because they're going to be mirrored. Uh, Follow-up question, are there any angles of arrival to calculate? No, because there are no zero. No, because there aren't any poles at all. Uh, correct. Departure. There are no open loop zeros, including no open loop conjugate zeros. So yeah, both of those uh, facts say that there are no arrival angles to calculate. So our departure angle is going to be the rule we follow is take the 180 and subtract the sum of the angles formed by the vectors drawn from the other open loop x's to the open loop x that we're departing from. So I see a 90 degree angle, a second 90 degree angle, and then this angle, which is a little bit tricky to work out. But that's, that's what I'm going to be tallying here. So I see 90 and 90. And this angle, which is going to be 180 minus this inverse tangent. Uh, rise over 1, so 1 over 2. OK, so I know that I drew this curve. But what I did is I took the, uh, what is it, the supplement. So I'm looking, I'm measuring that angle, and that's this arctan of 1 half. Actually, what's kind of cool here is that we get uh, the 180, we'll cancel those. And so the angle we end up with here is I just take this angle and I transport it over there uh, with a negative sign. Uh, but let's let's be careful here. So. I want negative 180 plus inverse tangent of 1 half. And I think I'll go back to MATLAB. So I want a tan in degrees of 0.5. So that's 26 and a half degrees. So this is negative 180 plus 26 and a half. Uh, so Negative 180 plus the answer. OK. Minus 153 and a half. Negative 153 and a half degrees. All right. So from this pole, I need to swing down 153 degrees, uh, which is close to 135, but a little bit more. So let's say there is our angle of departure. And if I mirror that down here, I think that's something like that. Questions on that procedure? Uh, yes. Go ahead. I don't know where you get that inner 180 minus the tangent inverse 1 half came from. So this angle is hard for me to think about when I am thinking about inverse tangents. This acute okay. angle is actually much easier for me to think about. What I just did is I took the supplement of oh. the angle that I want, and I got I looked at the angle that I didn't want. So gotcha. Yeah. Okay. What's next on the list? I think it's imaginary axis crossings. Yeah. Do you think we'll need those? Would that be a yeah? Yeah, that's a yes. You can tell because the closed loop poles all start in the left half plane, but two of them have to cross into the right half plane because the asymptotes cross into the right half plane. So I think in the last uh, example, I kind of breezed through this just because it was a little a little messy. I'm going to do, do a little bit more this time, but I'll give myself some more room here. So I'm going to use the Ralph Horowitz method. I told you that there were two methods to find the crossings, so I'll do the other method today. That's Ralph Horowitz. Uh, so the idea is that with Ralph Hur Horowitz, you're going to start with the closed loop characteristic polynomial. So CL, CP, and that is, if you work it out, it's S to the 4 plus 6S to the 3 plus 13S squared plus 10S plus K. And so your Routh array, I don't know if I'm going to have room on this slide, uh, goes S to the 4, S to the 3, S to the 2, S to the 1, S to the 0. 
And this is my favorite part. One, six, 13, 10, okay, and zero. Okay, so here, what are we looking at? We're looking at uh, six times 13 minus 10 divided by six. And I have conveniently done that ahead of time. That is 34 over three. Uh, in this entry, we actually get to teleport the K down because we have the zero in the bottom right. Okay, and then let's see, let's call this one C sub three. And to get C3, I'm gonna do the arithmetic over here. That's uh, 34 over three times 10 minus six times K normalized by 34 on three. And that is 10 minus nine over 17 K. So, and then let's we'll see, we can put a zero there, which means we get a row, a column of zeros, which means we get a zero there, which means we teleport the K down to there. So really the only, or the, the entry that will give us the non-zero K boundary is this C3. And so if I set this equal to zero, then I can solve for the K. So call it K hat for crossover is 170 over nine, um, which for our purposes, we'll call that 19. Okay. So why did I set it equal to zero? Well, it's because I want to solve for the marginally stable case. If I were to solve for the stable case, I would have this be a, an opening alligator, so greater than alligator. If I wanted to solve for the unstable case, it would be a less than alligator. Uh, but if I want to solve for the cusp, the right, the point right between stable and unstable, I'm going to set this equal to zero. Okay, so we know that when k is equal to about 19, uh, we're right on the imaginary axis, or we have two poles that are on the imaginary axis. We will also have two closed poles way the hell out here, but I'm not solving for those locations. I'm solving for the locations of the crossover. And so now, this is only half the battle, right? This doesn't actually tell me the location on the imaginary axis where the crossover occurs. It just tells me the K that causes crossover. So the next step is actually to go back to do something similar to what the other solution method is, and that is to set K in K equal to K hat in the closed loop characteristic polynomial and S equal to j omega. So that gives us something like j omega to the four uh, plus six j omega to the three plus 13 j omega squared plus 10 j omega plus 19. If we set that equal to zero, then what we're doing is we're solving for the root of this polynomial with the k coefficient fixed at 19. And we are enforcing that we're looking for a root of the form j omega. We're do that's a valid statement because I'm looking for a point on the imaginary axis, which is a point on the S-plane represented by the form j times a real number omega. Okay, so this is a polynomial in omega, which you can solve using your favorite root finding algorithm. So this gives us solutions at omega uh, equals plus or minus about 1.29 or plus or minus 3.37. So now this is actually kind of an interesting uh, situation. These are both valid numbers to get here, right? They're both real. They're both real values, and so they are, we can't throw them out just on their face. Uh, what we have to do is we have to go back to the picture that we've drawn so far and determine which of these is more likely. What do you think? Probably not the three. Probably not the three because of the way that I've drawn these asymptotes. All right, so this is negative one and a half, and this is a 45 degree line. So this, this crossing here is about one and a half, which means that the crossings that we're looking for are likely to be these, plus or minus 1.29. That's, that's, uh, that's the thought process that's going on in my head. 
Okay, so 1.29 and negative 1.29 is what we just uh, what we just found out. I had a quick question. Go for it. So the omega values, what, what happens, or will there be situations where they are close enough that you would need some sort of uh, more analytic way than just eyeballing it? So if they're close enough that it it's not obvious, then they're probably close enough that it doesn't matter. Is my uh, that doesn't really sound like a real mathy way to answer the question, but I think it's an engineering way to answer the question. If we'd gotten plus or minus one point three and plus or minus one point five, yeah, like. Yeah, that's a toss up, but Just it's like a good toss up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is is if any of this ever really matters, like if you're in a life and death situation that you need the most accurate uh, root locus diagram possible, first off, what are you doing? Second, uh, use MATLAB or use a computer tool. Um, that'll help you get a much more accurate picture if accuracy is of paramount importance. If speed or if just kind of a back of an envelope is of your paramount importance, then then what I'm teaching you here is is the way to go. Okay, cool, thanks. Yeah. One of these days, I'm gonna be in one of those life and death situations and I'll be like, ah, I wish I had my lab. No, I, I hope that never happens. Okay, uh, what's left? Breakaway points, right? Do you expect that we'll have any breakaway points here? At least one. Yeah, yeah, I suspect at least one because we have a head-on collision about to happen here and we need these to break away towards these asymptotes. Excellent. Okay, so on the very bottom of this slide, I will try and summarize the breakaway uh, analysis. So the denominator of the open loop transfer function, big D of S, is S to the four plus six S to the three plus 13 S squared plus 10 S. And if you differentiate that, you'll get, I don't know, some polynomial. Differentiate. Uh, what do you get? Four S to the three and 18 s to the 2 and 26 s and 10. The numerator polynomial, and yeah, I think this is worthwhile for me to point out, is not k because we defined the, the big N and the big D as the polynomials you get when you factor k out. So the numerator polynomial of the open loop transfer function is just this one, not k. Uh, in this case, it doesn't really matter. Well, I guess I guess it would once you did the uh, once you did the formula. But here, either of those derivatives get you uh, zero. So what we're doing is we're solving one times the derivative of d equals zero. So that's what this amounts to. Uh, if you well, I guess we can do this. This is four, eighteen, twenty-six, and ten. So roots of 4, 18, 26, and 10. Okay, so third order polynomial, we get three roots, two of which are complex conjugates. So I guess I can, I can, a quick question. Can you actually see my MATLAB screen? Yeah. Okay, I'm not sure which window I'm sharing sometimes. Um, these two are hogwash. Wait for it. Why are there only three instead of four? Um. Oh wait, there was it was degree three, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, S to the three. Okay. How can uh, you have a, a complex pole without its conjugate, though? Oh, uh, let me go back here. I think. Uh, so negative one point nine oh, plus plus yeah, zero i. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah, these are bad because we're looking for real solutions to this. And this is, yeah, so that's a good point is that MATLAB lists this as 0.000j. Um, probably if you actually went to the 18th decimal place, MATLAB would give you a, a non-zero uh, imaginary value here, but it would be like times 10 to the minus 17 or whatever. So that's, uh, that's the numerical inaccuracy that you, the trade-off that you get for 
having this powerful root finding tool is that it sometimes doesn't know to round things off when it should. So I think the valid solution that we're looking for here is negative 0.6. So the solution is, so three solutions, but the valid one is negative 0 0.6. Okay, back to blue. So actually, I may have cocked this up, but let's do it there. Okay, so there is our breakaway point. Okay, so to review what just happened. Um, we found the open loop poles and we plotted them with X's. There were no open loop zeros, so we got to skip that. Uh, we sketched in the real axis by checking the parity as we dragged our pen left to right. Um, we observed that there are a difference of open loop poles and zeros of four, which means we need four asymptotes. So we proceeded through the asymptote calculation formulas. We saw that there were a pair of complex conjugate open loop poles, which need departing from. So we worked out the departure angle. We saw that two of the asymptotes cross from the left to the right half plane, so we did the uh, imaginary axis crossover exercise. And we saw that two of the closed loop poles are going to hit each other on the real axis and break away, so we did the breakaway exercise. And now comes my favorite part, which is the artistic license. So right before I proceed, this picture is everything that we know precisely. What follows will be um, my interpretation of what comes in between. But again, I'm just going to connect the dots. So is there a, um, th is there a chance that you could be wrong with your guess and that it could be like the other poles? Yeah. I mean, there's always a chance I could be wrong. Um, but yeah, let's, let's, let's get through my initial guess and then we can talk about how it could have been wrong. I think that's a good idea. So these guys are departing and then they've got a, Got to do something like this. Okay, so this is my this is my best guess. Let's call it that. This is my best guess as to what the root locus of this system would look like as k uh, increases from zero. So, how could I have been wrong? Well. At the very beginning, there's no reason to think that the closed loop pole branch that starts close to an asymptote will be the closed loop pole branch that goes to that asymptote. So maybe we should, maybe I should just, can I duplicate this slide? Yeah. Oh my gosh, this is so much nicer than whiteboard. Duplicate the slide, and now I get to mark up this one without ruining the other one. Okay. So let's say we go back to we go back to before I filled in the gaps. And so we'll do this one in a different color. Um, we'll do it in orange. Complementary color. Okay, so this is what we had. This is all still accurate. Um, what could happen here? Well, this one could do something like that. And it could head towards that. That might be what you in might interpret from this departure angle. But if the, if this complex conjugate pole does that, then its brother, its, its conjugate brother here would have to do that. Do you agree? Yeah. And this we actually know can't happen because we never found that real axis point. Okay, so that's impossible. Right? Either either this point would show up in our real axis analysis or it would show up as a breakpoint and it did neither. So this this fanciful drawing can't happen. You see that? Okay, so I'm gonna yeah. get rid of that. So then what else could happen? Well, oh man, uh, that means that probably everything that starts in the north has to stay in the north, which means that this could happen. Uh, I guess it would have to go through there. 
yeah, I mean, <laughs> sure. And then that would mean this would have to happen. And then the mirror of that on the bottom. But I'll be honest, this is, and this is where Occam's razor comes in, is that this is not the simplest explanation. This is, uh, yeah, this is very unlikely to be the case. Um, how could you they show this? They normally not cross? They normally don't cross. That's, that's, that's what I'm looking at here, is this crossing point, I think, would show up for us somehow. And how would that show up? Well, if you were to ever, if you were to ever find this point, so what would that mean? That would mean that there is, there exists a K, there exists a K, uh, double hat, such that the closed loop characteristic polynomial factors into repeated conjugate roots such that the closed loop characteristic polynomial factors into S plus P, S plus P star, both of them squared. And that, I mean, that's just really unlikely, I think. I don't know if I could show it mathematically because there's a fourth order polynomial hiding in here that I have to factor. Um, but it just strikes me as very unlikely behavior. Certainly way less likely than that behavior. Okay. But off the top of my head, I can't, I can't absolutely prove to you why this doesn't happen, other than the fact that it is more complicated than my initial proposal. Let's see here. What, what could we interpret from this diagram? Now I'm trying to I'm trying to prelude into how we use root locus diagrams, but I guess before I do that, any other questions on how this diagram came to be? Uh, I have a question about the branches that we have for uh, the one, for the branches that approach the asymptotic lines. Do we find the other two? Uh, all four branches approach the asymptotes. Okay. All right. So I, the, my, my, actually, my question was a question about your question. Which two were you talking about? Oh, I mean, the two that we were trying to analyze further were they were crossing into each other's asymptotes. I guess we can safely say or confidently say that there was a case that would happen. I'm still not following. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm talking about the, uh, the branches that were doing loopy loops and crossing into each other's uh, asymptotes. So the fact that the asymptotes are down here and they're crossing I don't think that should really enter into your calculus because remember the asymptotes only dictate behavior at very, very large K. So the asymptotes only become relevant or important way the hell out here and way the hell out there, right? The fact that they do this crossing stuff and the fact that their center of mass is within this root locus branch, that is, that shouldn't really play into any of your calculations because this is, this is the realm of small k, right? And yes. asymptotes are only valid in the realm of large k. Okay, so riddle me this. Is this stable, is this system stable at high gains? No. Correct. Is this system ever well approximated by a second order system? No. Why do you say that? Because the uh, the open loop zeros or poles that we drew are pretty close together, so it's hard for certain two to dominate. But I think, yeah, and what you said is exactly true. I think that I can pick a K that puts a closed loop pole there and a closed loop pole there. And their real part I can pick to be arbitrarily small. So this, call it K1, puts a closed loop pole there and it puts the mirrored pole there. It will also put poles somewhere out here. And this I'm definitely making up where these poles will end up being. 
But remember, for every single value of k you pick, you'll get four points in the plane, four closed loop poles. And the argument that I'd like to make is that the real part of these poles is absolutely 10 times smaller than the real part of these guys. Because I can make the real part of these as small as I want. And the real part of these will have to be larger than two. You follow that? I see, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it may not be like important to your design because you may end up placing closed loop poles very, very close to the imaginary axis, which is in general a bad idea. Um, but I think that there are some range of Ks for which this fourth order system can be treated like a second order system, a second order, very under damp system. So yeah, th that's, the, that's the kind of interpretation that I can get from this diagram. But for, but for small Ks, uh, I think that you're right, that, that everything will be kind of in this region from negative two to, to negative uh, or to zero. I mean, honestly, for super small Ks, this uh, argument actually works again. Pick another K, K2, in which there is going to be a closed loop pole there, a closed loop pole there, a closed loop pole there, and a closed loop pole there. I think I can make the exact same argument because now there is a dominant single pole that has a very, very slow time constant and it will dominate the response relative to these three other poles. Okay, so again, these may not be the poles locations that you want. They may not be helpful in your design analysis, but at least if, if the test question said, uh, is the system ever well approximated by a second order or lower? The answer is yes uh, for the range of Ks that put your poles in here and in here. Questions on that way of thinking? Because I think that that's, that's kind of foreign to some students. Um, I think I'm going to skip the final example. And by skip, I mean postpone it to the next unit. Um, but I think that I'd like to start, at least start talking about the next unit in the last 10 minutes here. Okay, so I'm going to save this and I'm going to bring in the other set of slides. Professor, could I ask uh, just for some clarification? Of course. There is only, well, on, on each on each heading of the um, the asymptote, only one pole will follow that, right? Not yes. Two poles one. won't follow one one sided one heading of an uh, asymptote. Correct. One asymptote, one branch. Okay. And also, to the break the breakaway point wasn't halfway between those two poles. So is that because there's more? more exactly. Poles? When things are higher than second order, uh, we cease to get the symmetry that maybe you're used to seeing in second order systems. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, the higher order the system, the more offset the breakaway point will be. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's a good question.